Well, we're excited that you guys are with us. My name is Ben Bowles, and I'm one of the pastors here at Homeport, and I'm just so glad you guys are here to celebrate Easter, Resurrection Sunday uh, with us. Uh, I, there's so many guys that look out into the crowd. There's so many faces that were here um, yesterday. Uh, I, you know, we saw I mean, a huge crowd for us. Over 250 people were here. Over 3,000 eggs were given away. Uh, I was told by one guy who, who timed it. Our kindergarten through fifth grade Easter egg hunt with well over a thousand eggs, probably closer to 13 or 1400 eggs given away. He said the field was stripped bare in three minutes. <laughs> three minutes! There wasn't a single egg with candy or anything on uh, that field. I want to thank so many of our amazing volunteers that help us uh, get prepared for that. Last weekend, we had a great group of people that came in and volunteered to spruce up the inside and the outside of the building. We had a team of guys who cut the lawn yesterday to make it look absolutely amazing. We had ladies who planted new hibiscus in the front yard for us. Uh, just so many people. Everyone who donated eggs, you guys did it. We put a huge, huge... Uh, goal in front of you guys. I, this first Sunday, I said, we, we need to collect 3,000 eggs. Everybody's eyes was like this. 3,000 eggs? Are you kidding? And you guys did it. You guys are absolutely amazing. We have some of the most amazing volunteers uh, here at Homeport, and, uh, and you guys helped us create a, a, just an amazing day for our community yesterday. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I, I thank you all for everything that you do um, here. This morning, we're concluding a series we're calling The Lion and the Lamb. We've been working through the book of Mark, looking at very specific stories of Jesus where he has portrayed these attributes. As the Lion of Judah, Judah or Jesus has been powerful and strong, courageous and brave. As the Lamb of God, he's shown compassion and love and mercy, ultimately willing to lay down his life for you and for me and for all of humanity. This morning, we don't come here wondering if Jesus has been raised from the dead. We have 2,000 years of history, and billions of lives that have been changed that confirm that truth. Now we wait with great expectation and hold tight to the promise that Jesus will one day return for us. It's one of those things we are sure will happen. Maybe it won't happen in our lifetime, but we are sure that it will happen. I mean, think about all the things that have happened during our lifetime. Who would have thought that the Cubs would have won a World Series after 108 years of drought, right? Who would have thought that Tom Brady drafted 199th in the sixth round, this guy, taken on draft day, would go on to win five of nine Super Bowl appearances and garner so much hatred in my heart. Uh, for <laughs> 18 years of beating the Dolphins, year after year after year, it's, just, it's taken its toll on me. Sorry you have to see me like this. Or who would have thought that we would have seen a car fly through outer space, and not on a government rocket, but on a private company's rocket. We've seen so many great things happen in our lifetime. This morning, we do this thing called the question of the day, and we just I ask that you turn the people closest to you and just answer a question. And I wonder, going on in this line of thought, what is one thing you are sure will happen in your lifetime? What's one thing you are sure will happen in your lifetime? Take just a, a moment, turn the people closest to you, answer that question, and we're going to get right back together. All right, as we come back together, thinking about that, you know, no one knows when Jesus is going to come back. It may not happen in our lifetime, but it's okay because we know that it's going to happen one day. And so we wait with a hope of assurance, a hope of assurance that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11 when it says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's evidences of the things that we cannot see. Billy Graham used to say, you can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. And our faith shows the reality of what we hope for, evidences of what we cannot see. The writer of Hebrews is telling us that through our faith, through our trust in Jesus, we can have confidence in God. Though we can't see God, we can have confidence in the promises and the, and the love that he promises for us. We can be sure of that. His faithfulness endures forever, all the way from the beginning until the end, 
Jesus or God's faithfulness will endure. Today, we celebrate events that occurred on this Sunday so many years ago. Leading up to Resurrection Sunday was a week full of very important events that occurred, starting with uh, Palm Sunday. Jesus comes. Uh, riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. On Monday, he clears the temple. He begins to teach in the temple. And then Thursday evening, as, as he draws his disciples together for one last meal, the Passover feast, that meal that we call the Last Supper, Jesus is with his disciples. There he demonstrates servant leadership on a, on a much deeper level when he, when he bows down and he, he washes the disciples' feet. And he shows us what it means to be great, those that are willing to serve. He instituted the Lord's Supper that evening, taking the emblems of the Passover feast that they were celebrating, and, and he takes these emblems and, and, and he takes the meaning of the Passover to a much, much deeper level, a, a feast that had been celebrated since the Israelites were taken out of the land of Egypt for the, for the freedom from bondage of their sins. Now Jesus says that that, that that symbolism is so much deeper when he says now we're free from the bondage of our slavery, from the bondage of our death, the death that entraps us. It refuses to let us go. It lies to us about what it offers, all the while slowly squeezing the life out of us. Jesus freed us from all of that when he died on the cross and completed his mission when he raised from the dead three days later. After the, Lord's, or the Last Supper, we see Jesus spending time praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's, uh, before he's wrongfully accused and arrested. He's sentenced to die at the hands of of the Romans before Jesus is nailed to the cross he's beaten to the brink of death and then nailed to a cross in the most inhumane most torturous form of death that we've ever created it says he was scripture says he was forced to carry his cross to Calvary where he hung between two different thieves and on that cross at 3 p.m. In the darkness that covered the whole land, he breathed his last breath. Jesus died for our sins. It was the, he died under the enormous weight of our sins, a broken heart from, being, from God having to turn his back to us. When we, when we think about what occurred on the cross, this is the very first time in which Jesus and God are not connected. He had never, ever been out of the presence of God. And yet, when he bore our sins on the cross, God turned his back on him. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? After dying, Jesus spends the better part of three days in the grave. And when we think about all of this, we've got to stop and we've got to take a moment, we've got to pause and realize that it was our sin, it was our rebellion that sent Jesus to the cross. It was our sins, it was my sins, and it was your sins, the sins of every human being that sent Jesus to endure the cross. Without Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we would never be allowed into the presence of God. It was through his substitution, through his substitution on the cross where he died for our sins, where we receive forgiveness. The kingdom of God, Jesus, or Jesus uh, proclaimed in the very beginning of Mark, the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. It's in a moment like this that we need to stop and we need to repent of our sins. We need to realize what was done for us on the cross. We need to turn from that life and live for God. We end in Mark chapter 16 this morning. It starts off like this. Saturday evening, when the Sabbath had ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Slome went out and they purchased all the burial spices 
so that they could anoint Jesus' body. And in, in the first century, when someone died, they'd put them in a grave. They'd cover them in spices and, and herbs uh, to kind of mask the spell. The body would decay, and then they would go back uh, a long while later and collect all the bones. And so this is why they're putting these burial spices on Jesus' body. They think that he's dead. Very early on Sunday morning, though, they arise. They're, they've got their burial spices with them. And just at sunrise, they go to the tomb. And on the way, they're asking him, who is going to roll away this stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they look up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already rolled aside. These women, just a handful of women, get up. They're wondering who's going to roll away this huge stone from. I mean, this is a gargantuan stone that has been placed in front of the entrance to the tomb. Not only that, it's been sealed by Herod. Two wax seals on either side with a string so that it would prove if somebody had broken in. There were guards that were there to, to protect the, the tomb. And so they're wondering, who's going to roll this away so that we can put these spices on him? But when they arrive, they look up and they see the, stole, the stone had already been rolled away. You can't imagine what was going through their minds. When they enter the tomb... They saw a young man clothed in white robes sitting on the right side. And the women were shocked. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. This Jesus that you are looking for, Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, he isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Look, this is where his body lay. And you can imagine the emotion that was going over these women as they're looking at where they had just laid Jesus' body three days earlier. And then the angel says, now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of them to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. And the women fled the tomb, trembling and bewildered. And they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. They ran back. But just like Jesus had told his disciples, he would meet them days later, resurrected in Galilee. And when we look at this story, it's very interesting to note that God chose to reveal his first news to women. Um, This move that, that God makes when the angels proclaim this, it was because God wanted to demonstrate that forgiveness was for all. He bucks the patriarchal system of his day. And in Jesus, salvation is offered to everyone. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, free or slave. Jew or Gentile, salvation is for us all. God announces a risen Savior to women to ensure that in the historical record, this message would be proclaimed, that it would be for all of us, no matter who we are, no matter where we came from, no matter what we've done. Jesus had already demonstrated the power to raise people from the dead. We think about passages like Mark chapter 5, when Jesus goes in with Jairus's And he he takes Jairus' daughter by the hand and he raises her back to life. We think about passages like Luke chapter 11 when Lazarus was already in the grave. He already had the burial spices on him. And Jesus goes in and he raises Lazarus to life. He had already demonstrated his power over death. But in this moment, God raises Jesus from the dead after being covered in all of our sins. His substitutionary sacrifice was a sacrifice to end all sacrifice. Jesus paid our debt, and through being covered in our sins and taking on our death, he was raised from the dead, defeating death once and for all. Listen to the words of Paul. Once a man who persecuted, murdered Christians, but after having the first come to Jesus moment recorded in history, Paul becomes one of the strongest preachers and church planners of the first century. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, but let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. And it'll happen in the moment, in the blinking of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, from the trumpet sounds, all who have, been, who have died will be raised to life forever. And everyone who is living will be transformed. He says our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies will be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, Scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? 
For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its powers. But thank God, He has, uh, gives us victory over sin and death through our, uh, excuse me, but He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, what we have to realize is that the, rec- the resurrection calls us to live in victory. Not in defeat, not with our heads down, not worried, not concerned, but in victory. Listen to these words. We live in victory. Paul said God gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. One writer writes it this way. He says, what an amazing reality. This is the power that enables us not to sin, that gives us uh, freedom from fear. And it's an inner testimony to the fact that we are God's children and co-heirs with Christ. Doesn't that just blow your mind? But this is really, really true. And the resurrection of Jesus is proof that is meant for you and for me. Living in God and for Him is the actual living. That's life. There's freedom from anything that bogs us down. We can say no to sin. We can say no to lies. We can say no to anger. When we say yes to Jesus, when we say yes to him, when we choose Jesus' way of living, there's no guilt and there's no shame. And we have a savior who we can turn to in the inevitable storms of life. We are able to turn to Jesus and know that he is there for us. But it all starts when we say yes. Paul says it's not a secret. It's not a secret. You are not going to die and cease to exist. There's more to life. And if we can push through all the noise and all the mud and all the mire that bogs us down, and if we could say yes to him by taking one step closer, believing that he, he loves us, believing that he has forgiven us because we said yes. Yes, we believe. Yes, Jesus, I believe in you. Yes, Jesus, I will give up my life so that I can live forever. Yes, Jesus, I want to live for you and take that first step today. If you've never said yes to Jesus, we can help you take that step today, that first step of baptism. You believe that Jesus is your Lord. Now be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and the the gift of the Holy Spirit. At the very end of our gathering, we're going to have time. We're going to stand and we're going to sing and offer an invitation. And you can come forward and you can be baptized. Don't let a day go by where you have not said yes to Jesus. And if you're a believer... And Paul ends with a great reminder for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 58. He says this, So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. The resurrection, the victory that we have makes us strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do is ever useless. Be strong and immovable. Stand in your faith. Don't let any popular opinion or pressure from others move you from what you believe. You know what Jesus has done for you. And now you live with great expectation and a hope of assurance that Jesus is coming back for all of us one day. So stand firm and work enthusiastically. Next week, we start a new series called Get in the Game. And I want to invite every one of you guys to come back and join us for that that series. This is going to be a great series where we start and we look at uh, what God has done for us. And God has this amazing life for you and for me. He's given us these great gifts and talents to go and to serve him and to do the things that he's called for us. The things that he has planned for you. God has planned things for you specifically. He's prepared them for you, good things, long ago. And if you're not serving him, if you're not using those gifts and those talents, you're missing out. It's one time where this this new psychological phenomenon we call FOMO, fear of missing out. This is when it's really important. Not that we miss something on Facebook, but that we're missing life. We're missing what God has in store for us. 
God has something in store for you, a way to use your gifts and talents to change the world, to be a beacon of light and a beacon of hope. And it's time for us to get out of the stands and onto the playing field, every single one of us. So next week, come back and join us, both of our gatherings. Jesus is risen from the dead. So may the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Why don't you guys pray with me? Father God, this morning we abound in hope. Our hearts are overjoyed by this story, by, by being reminded that you have claimed victory over death, that one day you're going to come back for us all. And so with great expectation and a hope of assurance, Father, we come to you today thankful, repentive. Father, we love you so much for what you've done. And Father, if this morning there is someone in this room that has not given their life over to you, Father, I pray that you would work and that you would move. And Father, in, in the rest of our hearts, those who believe, Father, I pray that you would make us strong and immovable, that we would stand firm in this victory in which you've called us to. Where there's no shame and no guilt, just life and life abundantly. Father, thank you for loving us so much. Let me pray all this in your son's name. Amen.